is an unspoiled network podcast. Is Spoil Me covering The High Lord by Trudy Canavan, chapters one, two, and three. In this section, surprise, we get some Sari POV here, which I didn't expect to be uh, returning to at this late date. And also, there are multiple murderers at once, which I think, I theorized that there was, you know, because there was a succession of people coming after Acheron, that this was, I, but, but at the same time, one right after, no, I wasn't ready for that. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Ashley for commissioning this episode. Ashley has commissioned like the next four or five sections out of this book. So that's awesome. I am very excited to be able to, uh, sometimes when something hasn't been booked, I have learned after accidentally reading ahead by myself before letting somebody book the next section and then they booked a voyeur live read and I had already read it. I have learned to not read ahead no matter how excited I am until it's actually booked as a regular episode and I know it's safe. So it's lovely that Ashley has done that with this one so that I know immediately it's okay for me to go ahead. Um, this book is is a, a it's surprising me in a number of ways first of all it starts in a year after the last book ended which i definitely didn't anticipate that large a time jump i thought there would be a few months at most but it's a it's a big leap in time it's a big change in terms of what sania is experiencing at school because I wasn't really sure how much Regin's attitude would really change. I kind of expected him to have like a surface, what's the word, a surface um, alteration or, or, or what's the word I want? I, I, I expected him to make a good show of treating her better and making it so that there was no way for anyone to find fault with him publicly and there would be no actual proof of anybody uh, or that anybody could bring that he was mistreating her, but that he would find much more insidious, subtle ways to make her life miserable. And it seems like that's not like, it seems like her defeating him the way that she did genuinely has beaten him back like I don't know if it's if he has become sincerely more afraid of her now that he knows how strong she is if he recognizes that he has lost so much status amongst not only his own classmates but the other teachers because of how soundly he was beaten if he has been instructed to pull back by somebody who was like you know, for example, um, Geral is the one that's uh, his his guardian, right? I wonder if Geral told him to pull back. Like, there are a lot of possibilities for what could be going on here. But I am still, no matter which it is, surprised that this has gone as well for her as it has. Um, sorry guys, uh, Ashley says, I'm, I'm just sorry for accidentally scheduling this one so close to the last one. I hope you didn't have to rush to get through it. Oh no, 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 that's fine. Don't worry about it. It was no problem at all. Um, no, I was glad to be able to get to start the next book so soon. So yeah, th this is a surprise. Also the fact that, uh, Sari is back with us as a POV. Um, and that's really like, I guess I, I, if you had asked me if I thought we would ever get another POV from him, I would have said like maybe like one or two. Um, 
But I don't think I would have expected the book to start with that because I feel like the very first chapter being from his POV feels like an indication to me that he's going to be around much more now. And it turns out Ceres like really made a place for himself amongst the thieves. And I am surprised by how much he seems to relish that. Um, so because, you know, he was uh, he was a little hesitant before to take on an assignment where he had to kill somebody. He wound up going ahead with it and doing it. As we know, we don't actually see him commit murder, but it's, it's heavily implied. And I assumed that he did it. The person that he's killing is a terrible human being, but I'm not naive enough to think that the thieves only always kill bad people. I wish that were how it worked, but I doubt it. Um, but yeah, it seems like he's like really learning how to function within this system and is potentially going to be in a position where he can like wield some real power at some point. He's like working up to this. I'm not sure if he's working up to this consciously, if it's a sincere ambition of his or if he is just sort of, um, you know, rolling in that direction naturally because he's good at what he does. And is a reliable person with like decent judgment. So we'll see how that happens. Um, so the men he hunted deserved their fate, but Sari suspected there was a deeper purpose to the work he'd been commissioned to do than just reducing the murders that had plagued the city for the last few years. He did not know everything about the whole nasty business of that. He was sure, but he probably knew more than anyone else in the city. As he walked, he considered what he did know. He had learned that these murders were not carried out by one man, but by a succession of them. He had also noted that these men were of the same race, Sachakin. Most importantly, however, he knew they were magicians. As far as Sari knew, there were no Sachakins in the guild. So this is really, really interesting. Is like, it appears, because he says a succession, which is is what I had pictured was that, well, if one fails, then the other comes. But it feels like this is set up so that there's somebody in the city already preparing to take the place of the one who doesn't succeed. Like, I pictured because of the way this was described by Akron when he kills the assassin at the end of the last book, that it was more a, you know, once every six months somebody tries to come after me but this is being described as if as a continuous orchestrated tightly monitored effort which i just never expected and i'm not sure if this is these murders haven't been going on like you know the the start of the murders happens during the second book Lorland gets notified of the the um the fact that they suspected serial killing after i think the fourth one so it's not like this has been going on forever and they've always been plagued with these sorts of murders and that makes me want to know why they've upped their attempts to hurt Akarin all of a sudden it feels like Akarin was it, it, like they're trying to kill him because they're specifically threatened by him for some reason. And I don't know what that could be. Is he like, is he still looking into ancient magics and like getting more power than he's supposed to have? Has he tapped into something and they're worried that he's like heading in a certain direction with it? Are they themselves, the Sachakins, just discovering Something that, that Akron has known about and they are deciding to employ it finally because they've only like just started to figure out how it works. Is it is in other words, are they coming after Akron now because he's becoming more of a threat or because their knowledge is behind his and they are just catching up or neither of those two things. But I those are the two that come to mind right now. And I'm just really curious about this whole thing because it's all it's also taking me very much by surprise that Sari is on the job, man. Sari is over here going after assassins. And they know what to look for. Not only that they are looking for people of a certain race, 
because apparently there aren't a lot of Sachakins around here, so they attract attention. But also they are looking for the ring with the red stone in it, which apparently all of these assassins have had, which that's another really interesting thing. That's magic that when Akron performs it, Lorlin has never seen it before. I'm not sure if it is considered black magic in and of itself, but I feel confident that when magic involves blood and like the invasion of somebody else's mind and thoughts, that it probably is considered black magic. Um, but I guess that I, I had assumed that there was like one person sort of in charge and, and, that they were the one well, – and by in charge, I mean like there was one person who was sort of like the Daniel who was sent to Karelia with the ring. And then if they had a bunch of assassins coming after Acheron, that he had brought a crew of people with him and they were all his little like henchmen that would run around trying to – but it sounds like – they're not, they don't have like an overlord in the city. It sounds like it's a series of them and they each have this ring and they are all meant to report back, which makes a lot more sense than my original theory. It's just, I didn't consider how many of them there were. Um, so yeah, Sari is at a bull house with goal and this is when they, uh, find one of them. It was easy to locate the man goal had pointed out. His distinctive wide brown Sachakan face stood out among the pale Karelian ones, and he was watching the crowd carefully. Glancing at the man's fingers, Sari noted a glint of red in the dull silver of a ring. He looked away. What do you think? Gull murmured. Sari picked up his mug and pretended to gulp a mouthful of bowl. Too much rub for us, da. Leave him for another. Ah, uh, what does that mean? Too much rub for us? Like... Is it that this person is too big for them to take down? Is it that not, not enough has happened yet? Like, I want to know why he decides to leave this alone. Um, Sari slipped behind the grill into the passage below. The three coins he'd given Gold would pay three street urchins to deliver a message. Three urchins in case the message was lost or delayed. The recipients were crafters of one kind or another who would pass on the message via city guard or delivery boy or trained animal. Each man or woman along the path of the message knew nothing of the meaning behind the objects or passwords they were given. Only the man at the final destination would understand their significance. When he did, the hunt would begin again. So are they just figuring out exactly where this person is moving and they are sending out for help, like supporting cast members to come and like take this person down. Um, oh, okay. Ashley's saying, I think a good bit of it seems Sunia herself is more popular now. So Regin doesn't want to chance it. Yeah, that makes sense. Rub is in trouble. I think they just went in to confirm that he was really the magician. Their discussion is just for anyone who might notice them. Gotcha. Um, so they just wanted to like figure out where he was. I, the thing is to me, like, I I don't know if this person is, like, sleeping there. So how can they ensure that they can track this person down again now that they... I am I also want to know, Do are the Sachakins aware of the fact that the thieves know what is going on? Not that they really know what's going on, but know enough. Know enough to look f specifically for Sachakins and know enough to look for this ring as well. Later on... Lorland goes to see a body of a man who was obviously one of these assassins who turns up in a river and has had his throat slit and has not had his power drained from him. So he knows it wasn't a black magic killing. I'm assuming it's this guy and that we're seeing the aftermath of Sari scouting him out. Um, I found it really kind of funny that Sari is like killing these potential assassins but the thieves are not necessarily all aware that there's more than one killer in the city and that he they think that if they're if murders continue after Sari gets one of these guys, that Sari just got the wrong guy and that he's like not good at his job. And Sari's try not to let that bother him because he knows what he's doing and he knows that he's keeping other people from getting killed. 
But I just found that to be interesting. And he, he theorizes that there might be one or two thieves who know the truth, who know that there's more than one. But he doesn't – they don't share too much information with each other. They don't like to show their hand. Um, so he's not sure who knows and, uh, and, you know, therefore doesn't know – who appreciates the work that he's doing for what it really is versus the ones that think that he's just, you know, apparently I guess they think he's just killing random innocent people, which yikes, but, um, so yeah, so that's the end of that, um, section with him. And then we go to Sunia and so this is when we find out that it's been an entire year. Um, and, that none of the novices are looking at her in the way that they used to, that they're not like glaring at her. Nobody has a snooty look in the, on it, you know, that haughtiness. Um, the, the most attention that she really gets is people seeing the symbol on her sleeve, the ankle that indicates that she's the high Lord's favorite. So that's a lovely improvement right there. Um, and this is when she passes Regin um, his gaze met hers, then moved away again as they passed each other. She glanced back and let out a small sigh of relief. Every encounter since the challenge had been like this. Regin had adopted the demeanor of a gracious and dignified loser, and she let him. Rubbing in his defeat would have been satisfying, but she was sure he would come up with an anonymous and subtle way of getting his revenge if she did. Better if they ignored each other. Beating Regin in a public fight had done more than just stop his harassment of her, though. It appeared to have won her the respect of other novices and most of the teachers. She wasn't just the slum girl now whose powers had first manifested in an attack on the guild during the yearly purge. Um, now, nor was she remembered for being the rogue who had evaded capture. Uh, she was no longer thought of as the outsider who brought around Lord Fergan's downfall, either. The first thing they remembered about her was how easily she had won the challenge. They wondered just how powerful she was going to become. She suspected that even some of the teachers were a little frightened of her. Which is a, an interesting thing to know. For those who are listening, for some reason, uh, GarageBand stopped and I was in the middle of a sentence and I kept talking for like three more minutes and uh, didn't realize that it wasn't recording. So I'm going to repeat myself here and those in the crowd cast, please bear with me. Um, but I was saying that it was interesting that Sunia feels that some of her teachers might be afraid of her because it's obvious she's got real power and that's something to be afraid of in and of itself. But I also wonder if some of them aren't afraid of her because they still harbor the kind of like prejudices and classism that she has seen before and they're just keeping it more under wraps, but their fears are less like at the, they're less a reaction to her magical power and more of a reaction to her upsetting the system. Um, which is a, you know, <laughs> I think that we have all seen over the past year or so, um, that trying to upset long established systems of, class and gender are things that really trigger a lot of people to become incredibly angry and defensive. So I wouldn't be at all surprised if some of the fear that people feel towards her has nothing to do with her power in a way, uh, other than the fact that they know they can't go head to head with her to keep her in her place. Um, uh, so yeah, anyway, I just wanted to repeat myself on that point. And then the other point that I had made was um, that she isn't willing to make friends, even though a lot of the other students seem more willing to engage with her socially now because of how things have gone and improved for her. And she doesn't want to turn them into potential targets that Akron can take advantage of if she is to step out of line at some point. Um which, you know, is something that we see a lot in sort of traditional superhero narratives that like, well, you know, I'm going up against these big forces, like taking down these, uh, these super villains, and they can't know that you're important to me because they'll use you against me. But with Sunia, there's not that kind of agency behind it. She doesn't choose not to have friends because she's choosing to take up another fight. She's choosing not to have friends and also can't really fight back either. And is, is there's just so much less like 
it's so much more of a passive decision in a lot of ways. Um, and it's a shame, you know, for her because I think that she's making, I don't even want to say the right decision. I feel like, I think she's doing something smart. It's a shame, but I think it is like thoughtful of her and really considerate um, that she is worrying more about other people versus like what she would find comforting personally. Because of course, part of what's been so hard for her over the last year, two years at this point has been feeling isolated. So I'm sure having friends is very tempting, but she's willing to push that aside in favor of the safety of people that at the moment she doesn't really care about yet, but in theory she does, you know, and I just think that's really commendable. Um, Martin says it's also not something she can control. She can't just unknow something. Exactly. She's being held basically hostage over information in her head, not because of some actions that she's performing. She hadn't actually even done anything with the information that she had over what Akron was up to. The only reason Lorlin found out about it was because he went into her head over something completely unrelated. She didn't go to him with this info in an attempt to out Akron. And she wouldn't have by now tried to out Akron either because she doesn't know what he's capable of. But any possibility of any sort of movement is completely taken away from her by her present circumstances. So, yeah, I just really feel for her on that level. And I think it's really smart that she's doing this. It, it's it's a bummer, but it shows a lot about her character and her willingness to, like, you know, sacrifice her own happiness to make sure other people are safe. Um. So anyway, yeah, sorry. I just had to retrace my steps there for a minute. Um. Hopefully... GarageBand, it tends to, when GarageBand stops once, it tends to stop again. So just uh, be prepared for some strange pauses and for me to be very irritated, people in the crowdcast, because it may happen again. I may be served best by restarting my computer between this episode and the next one. Um, so this is when she heads back to uh, the... Play the uh, High Lord's apartments and we get a big, you know, sort of this is everything that happened in the last two books, which I just sort of skimmed. Um, and then we get something really interesting. Sunia knew as much about Karelia's neighbor as any other third year novice. All novices studied the war between the Sachakan Empire and the Karelian magicians. They were taught that the Karelians had won the war by forming the guild and sharing magical knowledge. Seven centuries later, the Sachakan Empire was all but gone, and much of Sachaka remained a wasteland. When she thought about it, it was not hard to believe that the Sachakans still hated the guild. This was probably the reason, too, why Sachaka was not a member of the Allied lands. Unlike Karelia, Eileen, Vin, Lonmar, and Lon, Sachaka was not bound to the agreement that all magicians must be taught and watched over by the guild. It was possible magicians existed in Sachaka, though she doubted they were well trained. If they were a threat, surely the guild knew about it. Sania frowned. Perhaps some magicians did know. Perhaps it was a secret only the higher magicians and the king were allowed to know. The king would not want ordinary people worrying about the existence of Sachakan magicians unless the Sachakans became a serious threat. Um, so this brings up all kinds of questions because, like, obviously, the vibe that, that we get from Karelia overall is that it's very British, right? There's a, there's a, like, whiteness to the people. There is an um, implied, like, European sort of vibe to them and parts of Eileen. Um, and then we get into, like, darker skin tones when we go into Lawnmar. Um, so there's the, the weirdness with the Sachakins being brown people coming into the white land as a threat. And I'm, like, concerned about how this is going to go down. But also, she doesn't know really anything about how Karelia created the Allied lands. Like, she knows what she was taught in school. And we all know that victors write history. And victors can make their victory look all kinds of, you know, 
justified and earned when that is not necessarily the case at all. So all she knows is that Sachaka got raised is it's the words that she kind of uses in terms of of what the uh what Karelia did to them and that they are now angry and refuse to be part of the guild and are doing their own thing and are now coming in and trying to kill the high lord and i'm like well you don't like for all you know their desire to take down the high lord is really justified their desire to not be part of the guild is really justified there's not any evidence in either direction that I find convincing um, so far that they are bad people, except for the fact that they're killing innocents, apparently, in order to try and, like, accumulate magical power via this dark magic, which, they're you know, like, obviously, that is not okay, but there is a feeling of them being, like, an oppressed people that makes me feel less bad about that. Um so I don't know. I'm I'm really curious to find out more about how this is going to shake out in terms of the history being revealed here and their motivations. Ashley says, yeah, I don't know how many times I've read this, but it just struck me on my reread today that the Allied land coming together are maybe probably the Allies in World War II. Maybe. If not, it's an interesting word to choose. Yeah, I feel like I can understand them. Shoot, like it, there is a de- like the description of the Sachakans does feel like they're being um, coded as Asian as well, and so I don't know. There's just a lot about the way that this is written that is bringing distinct parallels to mind that I don't know if those are necessarily intentional, but it just has me on guard a little bit. Um, you know the way that I'm going to find the exact wording. Um, the Tachakan Empire was all but gone and much of Sachaka remained a wasteland. That sort of feels like we dropped the bomb on them. You know, like, I don't know. I'm just, I, I just want to know more about too. Are they just, are they targeting Akron because of something personal or are they targeting Akron because he's the head of the guild and that's all there is to it. They're just going after the number one guy in, a, in hopes of destabilizing the guild which that might be all it is. Um, but there's something that feels like that's not all it is. I don't know. So we'll see. But I'm just really, you know, the whole the whole understanding that I have after the past like five years or so of intensive self-educating on our country's history and some of the things that we have done that have somehow never made it into the history books has made me a lot more suspicious of things like this. If I read this book five, ten years ago, I'd have a totally different reaction to this than I'm having now. So it just, you know, perspective just changes things so much. Um, so... Perhaps this was why Lorlin hadn't come up with a way to get rid of Akron yet. Perhaps he knew Akron had a good reason for using black magic. Perhaps he didn't intend to oust Akron at all. No, she thought, if Akron's reasons were honorable, I would not be his hostage. If he'd been able to provide his, prove his motives were good, he would have tried to, rather than have two magicians and a novice constantly searching for a way to defeat him. And if he was at all concerned for my well-being, why keep me in the residence where the assassins are likely to strike? Now, that those are all very interesting questions. And something that I have been thinking about as well, because, you know, the last book... I it, it's really implied at first that Akron is the murderer and I just didn't buy it. I was just like that. I just don't see that. There doesn't, there's not a good reason for that. And he's taking power in her, you know, the, the one time that she saw him using this kind of magic, he was doing it on a willing participant who is a servant who is otherwise apparently fine. So it's not like the, the man is like murderous or, um, or, enjoys like hurting people he has a servant who knows what he can do and is still loyal to him which indicates something and it could be that maybe the servant's crazy you know like madmen have their allies too but there was something about it that i just was like there's more to this than what she thinks is happening however it does beg the question 
if there is more to it, why hasn't he explained it yet? And I can't help but wonder if maybe he hasn't explained it because he's, he doesn't know all of the information himself. And that's part of why he's sending Daniel to continue his research into ancient magic. Um, and then, you know, in this section, he even gives her this book to read about construction of the the guild and like infusing magic into stone which turns out to be something that's like really technically this guy like stumbled on this idea via using black magic in reverse and nobody really knows that's how the man made his discovery so Akron is it feels like starting to try and like steer her in the direction of realizing that certain magic might not be wholly bad, but it doesn't seem to be working entirely either. Um, I'm going to get to that. So she goes, she gets home. She goes to have her meal with, uh, with Akron and he asks her what she studied today. And she says, architecture, construction methods, Shaping stone with magic? Yes. He looked thoughtful. Did you find it difficult or easy? Sunia hesitated. Difficult at first, then easier. It's not unlike healing. His gaze sharpened. Indeed, and how is it different? She considered. Stone does not have the natural barrier of resistance the body has. It has no skin. That's true, but something like a barrier can be created if... His voice trailed off. She looked up to find him frowning, his gaze fixed on the wall behind her. I want to know what the hell that's about. And and I'm wondering, <laughs> I had been sort of like toying with that question. When he's like listening in on what's going on with Lorlin, does that shit, like, is that what that was right there? He's mid-sentence and then he like tunes in on something with Lorlin and, and gets totally distracted mid-sentence and like stops speaking. Um, but he leaves... And I love the fact that uh, she gets up to leave and tells Takan not to worry about dessert. And she can tell Takan's super bummed and is like, but I worked hard on that. And she's like, well, if it'll keep, I'll have some later. And I know that feeling too well, Takan. High five, man. There's nothing more annoying than either, A, you work hard on making something and then the person that you made it for comes home and they aren't hungry and they don't want it. Or they come home so hungry that they inhale it and never say a word about whether they even liked it. And you have to assume they did because they ate it all, but they don't savor it and they don't seem to appreciate it. And you're like, I worked so hard on that. In 30 seconds, it's gone. Um, so, okay, we go to Lorlin um, from there. And he has to go to see a body that Baron has discovered. And... This body is of a man who was killed in the magical way. Um, he has to touch the body to be able to tell, but we learn that there is enough life force remaining in somebody who has been killed in the ordinary way when you touch them that you can sense it wasn't drained. But when Lorlin touches this victim, the life force is almost non-existent. So somebody clearly pulled it from them. Um, whenever the murderers resembled a black magic ritual, Lorlin was unable to avoid considering the possibility that Akron might be responsible. Akron did not wear a ring in public, yet he could be slipping one on when he left the guild. Why would he, though? He didn't need to keep track of himself. What if the ring allows someone else to see what the murderer is doing? Lorlin frowned. Why would Akron want another person to see what he was doing, unless he was acting on the orders of another? Now that was a frightening possibility. Yeah, Lorlin, you're letting yourself spin out, man. You gotta, like, not. You're doing what I do as I read these and try and theorize about what the hell's going on. Um, of course, Akron might not be the murderer. He had told Lorlin to investigate the murders, but that proved nothing. He might simply want to know how close the guard was was to discovering his crimes. So, yeah, um, he's just, you know, going uh, around and around in his head on what on whether or not Akron's responsible, what all he could like stand to gain from doing any of the various things. Um, and there is a pretty incredible fucking story too. Darlin, um, 
who is one of the other uh, magicians. I'm going to read this because I thought this was so funny. Um, Laura Lynn considered a conversation he'd overheard during one of the regular guild social gatherings in the night room. Lord Darlin, a young healer, had been describing a patient to three of his friends. He was dead when he arrived, but the wife wanted a performance so she would know we'd done all we could, so I checked. There was always plenty of life energy to detect afterwards, plenty of organisms that are active throughout decomposition, but his heart was, st was still and his mind was silent. However, I detected another heartbeat, small and slow, but definitely a heartbeat. He choked on a sevly. What was he doing with a sevly in his throat? They're poisonous. Did someone murder him? No, Darlin had sighed. Their bite is poisonous, but their skin contains a substance that causes euphoria and visions. Some people like the effect. They suck on the reptiles. Suck on reptiles? So what did you do? Darlin's face had reddened. The Sevely was suffocating, so I fished it out. Seems the wife didn't know about her husband's habit. She became hysterical, wouldn't go home for fear her house was infested with them, and one crawled down her throat during the night. Which, like, that is the craziest fucking shit. You're sucking. It's not even that you, like, kill it. You suck on the live reptile, which I just can't imagine if you are the reptile, what the fuck you think is going on. And I guess they do it that way without instead of killing them so that you can, like, you know, put it back in its cage and it regenerates this poison or whatever. And then you can go back and use it again. It's just so inelegant. Oh, my God. There's no better way of doing this. You can't wrap them in a cloth and have it absorb that. And then you suck the cloth. You have the whole fucking lizard in your mouth. I just can't get over that. It's such a fucking weird story. Um, so uh, opening his eyes, Lorlin lifted, lifted his hand from the man's arm. He stared at the shallow cut along the victim's neck, sure now that this was the wound that had killed the man. The stab wound to the heart had probably been made later to provide a more plausible cause of death. So I find this really funny in a way because it's it indicates that these assassins still think that nobody knows they're doing black magic, which that's part of the point, right? Is they're they're keeping it quiet that the that the guild is on to them. But I just find it so funny that they're still trying to like camouflage what they're doing. They just don't know how much everybody is already aware of. Um, so then we have this moment of, uh, with Rothen and Rothen's having a really hard time. He has stopped using so much of that, um, that sleeping powder, um, Nemin. So that's good because I had been very concerned that that was going to become something that he was like really going to battle. But he's very concerned about Sunia and everyone seems to feel a little sorry for him because Sunia, understandably, has shown no indication that she wants to visit with Rothen or cares about what's going on with him anymore. And he is obviously still so worried about her that everyone just is sort of like, oh, the poor guy, he really still cares and she couldn't give fewer shits and he's just hung up on this student and still like resentful that she got taken away from him when honest, obviously she's like really moved on and is functioning better with the High Lord as her uh, her guardian. And there's just a sort of like humiliating you know, I just, I don't know. I feel bad for him in that respect. And the way that people are like, you really just need to like, let this go. Like, they're basically like, move on, buddy, you know? Um, and also Ezreal is saying something about how like, she's glad that Rothen isn't using Nemin as much. And he gets a little bit resentful at the fact that Tanya, his servant is like alerting people to what, what his private actions are. Um, he knew Tanya had told Ezreal and Yaldin out of concern for his health and would never reveal his use of a sleeping drug to anyone else, but he still could not help feeling a little resentful. But how could he complain when she willingly played the spy for him? 
Tanya, through her friendship with Sunia's servant, Viola, kept him informed of Sunia's health, moods, and occasional visits to her aunt and uncle in the slums. Clearly, Tanya hadn't told Yaldin and Ezreal of her own part in any of this, or they would have mentioned it as proof of his worrying. Um, so he starts thinking about what's going on with Daniel and the fact that he had initially suspected that maybe Daniel was like in on something with Akron, but now he's realizing that that was unfounded. Also, um, it's really interesting here. The speculation regarding Tyann's sexual orientation had disappeared within weeks of it beginning. Everyone knew what self-indulgent gossips the Aleens were, and the only reason the assistant's rumors, rumored tastes and lovers had drawn the attention of guild magicians was because Daniel had been accused of interest in other men in his youth. That accusation had never been proven to be true. When no further gossip about Daniel or his assistant rose, most magicians had forgotten about the pair, which seems unlikely to me, but okay. Um, I'm glad to hear it. You know, I don't want Daniel to be under constant scrutiny regarding who he likes to fuck because it's nobody's business. Um, but yeah, I just like, I was really surprised that that was, uh, how things shook out there. Um, Daniel still sent research notes every few months, but each bundle was smaller. Daniel had expressed frustration at having exhausted all sources of knowledge in Aline, yet remembering how distant and evasive Daniel had been during his visit to the Guild, Rothen could not help wondering occasionally if his friend was holding something back. Furthermore, Daniel had mentioned discussing something confidential with the High Lord. He couldn't help worrying that Daniel was unknowingly helping Akron in some dreadful sinister plot. Which, I mean, that's a valid thing to worry I'm, it feels like everybody's sort of worrying that about everybody else that knows what's going on. Um, so then we go to Daniel and he, the, I like that this says he felt the glow of affection as he climbed out to greet his friend and lover. So he's being called lover. So that in my mind means that they are officially together. They have consummated their relationship and they are a for realsies couple that is like, you know, committed to one another. And I'm delighted by it. I am so happy that my my ship that I had been afraid to really invest too much energy in has actually panned out. Um, so he gets summoned to talk to the uh, head librarian. And he says... Um, Let's see where I'm trying to find like the spot. He tells me your research is going nowhere. Daniel sighed and glanced at Tyend. We could read every book in the library on the odd chance we might find something new, but we would need several lifetimes or a hundred assistants. While Daniel had first started researching ancient magic at Lorland's request, he had himself become intrigued by the subject. Acheron had begun a similar search long before he became High Lord, which had kept him roaming the lands for five years. He had returned empty-handed, however, and Daniel had initially assumed Lorland had asked him to retrace Acheron's steps in order to gift his friend with some of the information he had lost. But six months later, after Daniel had traveled to Lawnmar and Vin, Lorland had abruptly informed him that he no longer needed the information. So we're getting this recap. Um... After Daniel had returned to reseal the entrance, he had researched, he had searched the great library in vain for a reference to it. Clearly, it used a form of magic unknown to the guild, which that's pretty scary stuff right there. I feel like for a lot of people who are used to things being organized and managed, if the guild is supposed to be like the sole source of magical training in the allied lands and there's some magic out here that's real strong that they don't know anything about. That's got to send up some, like, alarm bells, right? Um, I sus suspect I'd find out more if I went to Sachaka, but the High Lord denied my request to journey there. Um, Irand nodded. A wise decision. You can't be sure how well you'd be received. There's sure to be magicians there. Though they'd not be as skilled as you and your colleagues, they would pose a danger to a lone guild magician. After all, the guild left much of their land wasted. There's bound to be some lingering resentment for that. Um, so then they theorize about whether or not he's, they're trying to start like their own sort of rogue guild, which is an interesting idea. They may have done that already. You don't even know, you know? Um, and then there is, um, a note 
I, from the High Lord who says, uh, you will find your relationship with the scholar Tien helpful in persuading them that you can be trusted. What does he mean by that? It's possible the rebels will try to use this personal information against you once you have arrested them. I will ensure that it is understood that I asked you to give them this information in order to achieve your goal. You said he didn't know about us. How can he? Or has he just listened to the rumors and taken a chance they might be true? A man like the High Lord does not take chances. Who else have you allowed to know of your relationship? There is no one else unless we've been overheard. Before we start hunting for spies, there's one possibility we should consider. Akron has some unusual abilities. For the rest of us, there are limits to mind reading. But Akron searched the mind of a criminal who didn't want him in his head, basically. Like, that everybody is used to willing participants, but Akron can do it with somebody who's unwilling, which is not common. Um, so he's thinking that maybe it just, like, pulled, got pulled right out of his head. Your assistant has encountered these rebels before. He ought to be able to arrange an introduction. How could he possibly know that? I hope you could tell me. The scholar frowned down at the letter. Everyone in Aline has a secret or two. Some you talk about. Some are best kept to oneself. A few years ago, I was invited to a secret party by a man named Royand of Moraine. When I declined, he assured me it wasn't what I thought, and he said there'd be no... Ah, uh, indulgences of the flesh or the mind. He said it would be a scholarly gathering, but his manner was furtive, and I took that as a warning and didn't attend. So that's interesting, and I'm very eager to find out exactly how that, like, what that winds up being about. Did, does he think that they're, like, teamed up with the Sachakins? Like, what's going on there? Um... So your role is to act on behalf of the High Lord in matters that are the do, um, that are the domain and responsibility of the guild. Sometimes carrying out that role means taking risks. Let's hope this task risks only your reputation and not your life. Yeah, let's hope so, huh? Um, they began to discuss ways to approach the rebels. Not for the first time, Daniel was glad to have the librarian's confidence. Tyen had insisted several months ago that they tell his mentor about their relationship, assuring Daniel that he would trust Iran with his life. To Daniel's consternation, the old man hadn't been at all surprised. <laughs> Which, I mean, come on. Of course he hadn't. If you've got a lick of sense. Um, <laughs> I can just imagine what it must be like being around those two. They have chemistry on the written page. Like, what they must be like in person. Um... So then we go to the moment where Sunia gets given this book to read by Akron, and he tells her that it shouldn't leave the library at all. And like people don't even know that it exists, which is pretty intense. Um, it is rare and irreplaceable, and it is not to leave this room. You will not speak of it to anyone. Only a few people know it exists, and I prefer it stays that way. So it's a journal of the person who like built the guild's buildings. Um, she realized from her recent studies that the time of writing this diary, Lord Corrin had been young, restless, and in disfavor with his elders for drinking excessively and designing strange, impractical buildings. I love that. Um, I had the chest brought to my rooms today. It took some time to open it. I disengaged the magical locks easily enough, but the lid had rusted shut. I didn't want to risk damaging anything inside, so I took great care. When I finally had it open, I was both disappointed and pleased. It was filled with boxes, so my first sight of the contents was very exciting. But as I opened each box, I found only books inside. When I opened the last box, I was greatly disappointed. I had found no buried treasure, just books. They're records of some sort. I've been reading late into the night and much puzzles me. Tomorrow I will read some more. I know what I have found. The missing records. Um, full of forbidden knowledge. After a gap of several weeks, there was a long entry describing an experiment, the conclusion of which read, At last I have succeeded. It has taken so long. I feel both triumph and the fear I should have felt before. I'm not sure why this is. While I was failing to discover the ways to use this power, I was still somewhat, somehow uncorrupted. Now I cannot truly deny that I have ever used black magic. I have broken my vow. I hadn't realized how ill that would feel. 
All who know me know my love of stone. It is the beautiful flesh of the earth. It has cracks and creases like skin. It has veins and pores. It can be hard, soft, brittle, or flexible. When the earth spills forth its molten core, it's as red as blood. After learning of the black magics, I expected to be able to place my hands on stone and feel a tremendous store of life energy within. But I was disappointed. I felt nothing, less than the tingling of water. I wanted it to be full of life. That's when it happened. Like a healer trying to will a dying man back to health, I started to infuse energy into the stone. I willed it to live. Then a remarkable thing began to happen. This was the discovery that made Corin famous and influenced guild architecture for centuries to come. It was said to be the greatest development in magical knowledge for centuries. Though what he had done was not actually black magic, the forbidden arts had led to the discovery. Which, you know, that seems like the way a lot of things happen. Um, that pe people discover things because they're experimenting with some shit that maybe they shouldn't, you know. Um, so that's the end of chapter two. I'm running out of time here. I have to speed up. Um, Sari is writing a bunch of different notes. Uh, he has learned to read and write, which is pretty fucking impressive right there because he was not a good hand at that um, when we last left him. And he has them. Um, he puts the scrolls inside these tubes that have a, uh, a point on one end and he throws them so that they like stick in the wood paneling like he can use them like darts basically which is a really cool idea and this is when he meets savara savara is a sachakan woman allegedly here to help she isn't convincing to me she's very beautiful and siri can sort of tell that she's used to her looks being able to like get her what she wants it's she's not somebody who's not conscious of her beauty and she knows how to use it to her advantage. Um, and she's uh, she says um, the other thieves say you are the one hunting the murderers. I can help you find and kill them. Um, I have ways of recognizing them. So do I, Sari pointed out. Why is your way better? I know more about them. For now, I'll tell you that the next one entered the city today. He will probably take her day or two to gather the courage, and then you'll hear of his first kill. He considered her reply carefully. If she didn't know anything, why offer this proof? Unless she planned to manufacture the proof by murdering someone herself. He looked at her closely, and his heart went cold as he belatedly recognized the broad facial features of that and that particular shade of gold-brown skin. How had he not seen it earlier? But he had never seen a Sachakan woman before. He had no doubt now she was dangerous. Whether she was dangerous to him or to the murderers remained to be seen. So he tells her that he suspects that she could just kill someone herself. And she's like, well, you can have people sit on me if you want to prove that I'm not the one doing it. And he's like, all right, I will. And he tells uh, Gaul to put four people on her, but only let her see two. So that she can feel at times like she's, you know, shaking the people that are watching her when, in fact, there are still others, which is a smart move. I liked that. Um, and let's see where. Oh, and she has um, all of these knives as well, which uh, Goal hands him to in, uh, inspect, but he gives them back to her. And I'm interested in like the, those knives and if they have any sort of magical um, connotations or capabilities um and then we go back to sania um and she's thinking about the book that she read the night before she's in class now but she like stayed up all night reading um and she gets to the final entry i have decided when the foundations of the university are complete i will secretly bury the chest with all its contents in the soil beneath it along with those terrible truths will go my own in the physical form of this book Perhaps by carrying out this act of concealment, I will finally smother this nagging guilt at what I have learned and used. If I had the courage, I would destroy the chest and its contents, but I fear to judge differently from those who placed it in the ground in the first place. They were most definitely wiser men than I. The chest must have been rediscovered or she wouldn't have Corin's diary in her hands. What had happened to the rest of the books? Um, so, yeah, I'm obviously super curious about that also. I assume Akron has them. 
but maybe he only has this and, and he's still looking for the rest of the books. Um, what had he revealed to her? That Corrin had used black magic and that it led him to discover how to manipulate stone. That another magician, a famous magician, had committed the same crime as he. Perhaps Akron wanted her to consider that he too might have learned it against his better judgment. Perhaps he wanted her sympathy and understanding. Corrin hadn't held a novice hostage to keep his crime secret, however. Um, Akron, perhaps Akron simply wanted to destroy whatever illusions she might have of the famous figure that Corrin was. I'm like, I think you're off base on all of this. I think there's a lot more to what he's showing you. You're making this too. She's she's too concerned about what she knows about Akron and him like justifying himself to her. And I think he's trying to show her a much bigger picture. And she isn't grasping that yet. So this is when she starts learning about how to create illusions, which are something that can be used in battle um, to, you know, put somebody off their guard. And one of the kids in the class with her sends her a little illusion of like a flower. And he's, this kid is obviously flirting with her. And I really liked this, that she's sort of like, she doesn't get it at first. And then when she does, she thinks about Dorian and then is like, well, Dorian's not an option either. And she has to push it all away. And I'm like, oh, shit. But somebody's interested in her. Um, so then comes the section with Lorlin where he goes to another uh, to see another body. And this is one that's clearly one of the killers. Um, and the guy has like pieces of a silver and glass ring buried into part of his body um our investigator found shards of glass embedded in the skin and the grips of the setting were bent in a way that suggests the ring was smashed he believes the stone was glass are you sure this is the murderer the witnesses were very convincing um so i'd prefer if the murders simply stop now lorlin replied as would most Imardians, Baron agreed, but I still have the murderer's killer to look for. The murderer's killer. Another black magician? Akron, perhaps? He glanced at the door they had just passed through. The corpse was proof that there were or had been black magicians in the city other than Akron. Was the city filled with them? Now that was not a comforting thought. But Baron obviously needed to discuss the discovery further. Smothering a sigh, Lorlin followed the guard back to his office. And that is the end of chapter three. And I finished just in time. So lots to consider here. Tons. And um, um, I have no idea exactly how this is going to go. I still haven't gotten enough of a sense of this author to know if they would be like what kind of illusions they're making to real life. Um, so um, I'm going to be very excited to see where this goes. So thank you very much to Martin and Ashley. There's a third person here, it looks like. Um, Kyle is here. Hi, Kyle, for coming to this. Um, and thank you to Ashley for commissioning this book. And I will be seeing you all again very soon with a new episode. Toodaloo, motherfuckers. <laughs>